Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's study in the book of Daniel, chapter 11. As we return to where we left off this last week, shall we now ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that our minds might be opened, so that as we search as a miner looking for gold, silver, precious jewels, that we may uncover light and may be blessed to give this light, to share this light, to bring forth the soon coming of the Savior. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we are given to come before you today. We ask now, Father, for your direction and your guidance. Please, Father, help us to be willing to be led by your spirit. May your angels protect us as we study together. We thank you, Father, that we may study, that we may come to know your truth. Direct us now. Guide us in all things. Help us so that your will may be done. We need you. We ask that you forgive our sins. We ask that you help to cleanse us, to make us right so that we may stand before you. May your will be done in our lives in this study as your will is done in heaven. Help us that we might be able to see the gold and leave behind the dross. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we left off in verse 36. We were addressing several points from this, so we have a very quick review today. Smith has a comment. The verse itself reads, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall also be done. Now Smith's comment here, the king here introduced cannot denote the same power that was last noticed, namely the papal power, for the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. So <clears throat> Smith is trying to introduce something beyond the papacy. Do you recall what our conversation was about this this last week? Well, I remember part of it. I mean, he says if it says a king, which it doesn't, it says the king, ha malik. But we, we had a number of observations. One is, of course, that we have in each of the lines of prophecy, we end with the papacy. Now, he's going to, of course, have the papacy earlier, but now he's going to introduce this new power, which he's going to say is athe atheistic France. Um, we can compare this with Second Thessalonians. We can see that this is the man of sin, the characteristics here. Uh, Ellen White connects with Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. And so the consistency of, of these lines of prophecy is that this is still the papacy. There were some other points that we brought up. I don't remember everything. Is there any other particular thing, Dwight? That, uh... Well, again, since this is a review, I think that suffices. Because here again, Smith, as he states, the only difficulty in applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the. For it is urged the expression, the king, would identify this as the last one spoken of. So as, as you just pointed out, in the Hebrew, this is properly translated, the king. Mm -hmm. Smith continues, if it could be properly translated, a king. Now, his assumption here is based, as he states, if it could be properly translated a king, there would be no difficulty. And it is said that some of the best Bible critics gave it this rendering, Mead, Wintel, Boothroyd, and others, translating the passage, a certain king shall do according to his will, thus clearly introducing a new power upon the stage of action. Now, actually, when you put a certain king, that's not the same as a king. Right. Now, 
of course, what they're trying to do there is take the definite article and making it definite by saying certain, correct? Correct. Hebrew does not support that. Right. It's just the king. So it's the king that has been referenced. And that's one thing about the article uh, that, that, that he is actually correct about is that it, it, if, it, if it said a king, then it would be introducing a new a power. But, but it, it, there's a continuity of thought in the king. So it's, it's a definite king, the king that has just already been the, the power that's already been discussed. So, I mean, this is one of the places where his whole argument falls apart. Now, you know, so taking this rendering of me, Winthrop, Boothroyd, and others, right? This is sort of a weak way of looking at things. I mean, it's it's a weak way of presenting an idea or, or an argument, it, or maybe a lazy way of doing it, because the reader isn't going to realize that it actually, you know, can't be translated as a king, right? So the way that he presents it, it, it looks plausible because some other people have said that it can be a certain king shall do according to his will. But his position is illogical. Yeah, well, it's illogical and inconsistent, I mean, in so many different ways. Now, of course, we know that there is a large number of, of Adventists who are dealing with this this whole issue of, you know, I mean, people who've been sort of connected with this movement, um, what we call conservative Adventists who accept Ellen White's endorsement of thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on the Revelation as somehow inspired that, that you know, we have to accept what uh, Uriah Smith says. And, and some of these people are extremely unreasonable people. And it's not an argument against them. I'm just saying that I've tried to have discussions with some of them and they have some of the, uh, the strangest arguments, because if you accept Ellen White's endorsement of Uriah Smith's book, um, then the things in his book that contradict what Ellen White says <laughs> in, in sometimes very plain statements, uh, there becomes this contradiction. So this contradiction, either, you know, Ellen White's endorsement overrides her own inspiration in other areas, or, you know, she's wrong in, in endorsing it as inspired in, in their minds. And we would just say it's God's helping hand. That's not really an endorsement that a book is inspired. Well, the, the logic that I'm seeing with this mm-hmm. is Smith is making the comment that some of the best Bible critics give it this rendering. So now he is, he's basically appealing to that of Mead, Wentzel, Boothroyd, and the unnamed others, mm-hmm. rather than a, a plain, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. I mean, he could have just said lots of people think this, you know, um, it's, it's not really a very good argument. No, it's not. Because we would have to look at each of these writers. What is their intent in interpreting the passage in the first place? Are they going to have the same interpretation as him in the passage itself? Are they um, looking at this as dealing with the Tychus Epiphanies? And, or, they, or some other person, Right. Definitely not all of these people who translate it this way are saying that this is is atheistic France. Right. So so when, when I look at, at what someone says about, you know, a certain Bible verse and how it should be translated, um, I have to try to look at what are their motivations for, for trying to decide to translate it a certain way. But, I mean, this is something that's pretty simple in Hebrew. It, it's not it's not complicated. We we do have the definite article, ha, you know, that letter ha at the beginning of Melek, which is king. So the king shall do according to his will. So it his his argument falls apart. But it falls apart also when we start looking at the characteristics and comparing them at other places. 
we can see that this is not talking about an atheistic power, but a power that's put itself in the place of God. Right. Right, which is the papacy. So he picks up on nor regard any God in the sense of, well, it's atheistic, but that's not what it's it's saying. I mean, the papacy isn't atheistic, but it is. It doesn't regard any other God other than itself. And and we can see that some people would translate this. They're not regarding any of the pagan gods directly. Right. That it's 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 got this new God that that their fathers didn't know, saying that this is the papacy that has inherited paganism. But now it's not regarding directly any of those pagan gods, but this sort of new God, this syncretistic God that that's a mixture of paganism and Christianity. And th that would be a much better way to read the passage. I mean, especially in the whole context, right? He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every God, shall speak marvelous things against the God of God, shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. And if we look at this thing that prospers till the indignation be accomplished, and we understand the indignation to be the, the 2520, it, it makes much more sense to apply to the papacy than to, you know, France uh, at the end of that 1260, right? And yeah, because it goes on, right? Uh, the king shall do according to his will. Let me see. He, um, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. I'm just looking through here. Where? Yeah, the next verse, 30. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So, so that's the papacy. Not regarding any God is not is not atheism. It's just that he's magnifying himself above all, all gods, everything. It's just so plain. I don't, I don't really understand his reasoning. Well, as he had continued, mm -hmm. three particulars must be shown in the power of which fulfills his prophecy. Number one, it must assume the character here delineated near the commencement of the time of the end to which we were brought down in the preceding verse. Second, it must be a willful power. Third, it must be an atheistical power. Or perhaps the two latter might be united by saying that its willingness or willfulness would be manifested in the direction of atheism. Now, does, does he define here really what he means by a willful power? Not really. Right. He just puts it there. Yeah, I know. I, that was sort of, I knew that. So but the question is, what what is that when he does according to his will? We would have to look at the other powers that do according to their will. And we can see that they're going to be uh, of these kingdoms. Right. Right. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, even in its divisions and Rome, pagan. So now he's going to introduce all of a sudden France as being a willful power. And I don't think that he could demonstrate that because it has to do, be, do according to his will. Was France able to do according to his will? I would say no in the context of what, what that means prophetically. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? No, I agree. Yeah. Hopefully people get, get the idea of what that, what that means. And, and and I think it's really in the context of of Daniel uh, that we see, you know, how this this operates, doing according to his will. Uh, the word does have, you know, lots of different meanings. Um, ratson, ratson, uh, pleasure, delight, favor, goodwill, acceptance, will, uh, desire, pleasure, self, will. So it's it's basically its own pleasure. It can be uh, to be pleased with, that is specifically to satisfy a debt, is the word that it comes from, ratsa. But, um, but if we look at the different places in which this is used, because he has to do according to his will. Yeah, so we have it in Daniel 11.3, Daniel 11.16. So 11.3, that's, of course, Alexander. 
eleven sixteen. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will. So that's going to be Rome, right? And then we have uh, verse thirty six, and the king shall do according to his will. So we have that of Alexander. We have it of Rome itself, and now we have it of of papal Rome. But we have similar expressions. Angela has a comment there. If somebody wants to look at that, I'm just looking at these other verses. What was this? Yeah, while you're looking at that, the comment. Yeah. I think the papacy speaking against God is its contradiction of God's word and character in papal edicts and other statements. Francis the Fiend is notorious for this. Yeah. Now, there is something that I think we're going to need to also just place in the record. Are you aware of what the Catholic Church has planned for this December? I'm not aware. This will be one of their, quote, holy years beginning December 24th. So there's there's quite a number of things that are going to occur in 2024. Coming soon, on the 15th of August, we will have the 490th anniversary of the founding of the Jesuits. On the 24th of December, we're going to have the proclamation of a, quote, holy year, which they do roughly every 25 years. So this is going to run from the 24th of December, I think, to the 16th of December of 2025. This will be the second holy year with Francis because he declared a, another, quote, holy year in 2015. So okay. as, you're, as you're looking at these other verses, what else? Okay, yeah. So, so the other one, because we have, he does according to his will, that is Daniel 8, 4, referring to uh, Medo-Persia, right? So we have okay. Medo-Persia, we have Alexander, we have pagan Rome, and then we have papal Rome, all do according to their will, right? Okay. So if we're going to have Medo-Persia, Greece, and then pagan Rome, and then France, that's not consistent. So to be a willful power would be to be one of these world kingdoms. So it doesn't, it doesn't fit number two. And also there's no evidence that it's an atheistical power, right? That's, that's just a misreading of the text. And and it doesn't also it does to assume the character here delineated near the commencement of the time of the end. That that's not what it's saying either. There's no reason to say that its its character must be assumed near the commencement of the time of the end. It's not implied in the text in any way, right? That's just something he's reading into the text already from his interpretation, right? Because he's you know. So we have the time of the end and the time appointed. So that's 1798 to 1844. And so we have this king doing according to his will. We know that that's going to be during the 1260, right? And it's going to be accomplished. Uh, he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. So that indignation, that means he's pro prospering during that time of the indignation. That is the word till uh, 5704, ad, right? So it's a really common preposition. It, it means lots of different things. During the indignation. He shall prosper during the indignation uh, till it is accomplished, right? So, so there's no way to say that it's at the end, right? So the whole idea is that he's going to prosper during the indignation until the end of the indignation. Right. And and then it says that determined shall be done for that determined shall be done, uh, which is the word karats. It means properly to point sharply. That is literally to wound. So when we get the deadly wound at the end of the indignation, that would fulfill that um, 
that it's the papacy. Does that make sense? It gives a much better explanation than what Smith is giving. Yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, it, if Smith had never written this, I don't think there would be anybody who would try to say that this is France. You know, nobody, no Adventists. Now, we know that he got it from Josiah Litch, who got it from Alexander Keith. But whether Smith is aware of Alexander Keith or not, I think Smith is always trying to present what he understands to be what the pioneers taught. I mean, you have to give Smith that. He's not trying to come up with new ideas. He, he's trying to take what's established. The problem is, is he can't see the unfolding of light. He can't, because of his, we'll use the word methodology, the fact that he's dependent upon commentators. And he may feel that that's safe, right? That, that he can't, because, you know, we have this, um, uh, well, this goes back to what we were talking about before, before we started recording this study. Um, so I'm just going to share a few of these statements. Um, that I, that I sent out to some of you. Um, uh, when Christ in his work of redemption is seen to be the great central tr truth of the system of truth, a new light is shed upon the events of the past and the future. They are seen in a new relation and possess a new and deeper significance. It is thus that God, by his Holy Spirit, has opened these things to his people. From this standpoint, now she's writing here about the, the volume four of the Great Controversy. From this standpoint, volume four of the Great Controversy presents to our view the past experience of the church and the great events of the future. In that book, God has laid out before us uh, their true relation to the events that are to take place upon uh, our earth. But Satan is constantly seeking to intercept every ray of light that God sends to prepare the people for what is before them. To those who should give the light to the world, he will present plans which appear to be for the promulgation of truth, but which will, in reality, hinder the work. These plans appear so plausible, however, that they are accepted and thus his object is accomplished. This is why volume four has not received the attention it should have had. Now, so there's there's a number of things here, and, and there's a lot more quotes that, uh, that I have here. But these were given in the context of the July 18, 2020, and the failure of that prediction, and how uh, Jeff is presently trying to frame the period after July 18, 2020, saying, uh, that it's a tarrying time and that the light of the seven times has been rejected. And so um, now part of the problem that Jeff has and, and something that we all have to grapple with is that God's light unfolds. And as it unfolds, old light is seen more clearly. That's something that we have established as Seventh-day Adventists, if we hear something that calls itself new light, but says Ellen White was wrong or, you know, the pioneers were wrong about, uh, you know, this thing or that thing because they didn't have this light. And, and whatever that new light is contradicts what we would call established truth. Then obviously it can't be new light. Right. So if somebody comes along and says, you know, we actually should be keeping a lunar Sabbath. And Emma White just didn't have light on the lunar Sabbath. So she did the best she could with the weekly Sabbath. But we know that there's a lunar Sabbath. If somebody comes along and says something like that, well, you can know it's not true for lots of reasons. But one simple thing is it contradicts established truth. It, it would make nonsensical the whole issue of the Sabbath and Sunday debate. Because both Sabbath keepers and Sunday keepers would be in error. And, and sometimes they would be correct, right? Sometimes the Sabbath keepers would have be keeping the correct Sabbath, you know, if it lines up with the lunar Sabbath. And sometimes the Sunday keepers would be correct, keeping the correct Sabbath. Also, the lunar Sabbatarians sometimes would be keeping Sunday and sometimes Saturday. 
And sometimes, you know, Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, right? So, um, it, 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 so what, what has happened in, with, with Adventism is that there is this fear of new light, right? So, so Smith, he's, he's trying to hold to old light, but he's not able to see new light. So it's sort of the other extreme. You've got people who want to hold on to something. This is what all, all happened during all of these other churches during the Protestant Reformation. People never go farther than Luther, or never go farther than Calvin, or never go farther than John Wesley, right? And, and Adventism is no different. And, and then we also have people on the other extreme who want this new light that's going to reject old light. But we can, we can see... And, and that's why I like this, this quote, because she's talking about the book, The Great Controversy, that it shows uh, this progression of events and how God's light unfolds over time. And so this movement has experienced this. We've experienced an unfolding of light. And, you know, the light, the light is light. It's, it's, it's showing us that the past is correct. And it's giving light for the future. We can see that we're on a solid course. And we're not dependent upon commentators' opinions or even one man's opinion or even a group of men's opinions. We have the word of God and and the history that has unfolded in this movement. So I know that's a little bit off track from this topic here. But what we can see that that's really the problem with Smith is he's trying to hold on to something, but he doesn't fully understand what he's what it is. Right. So Ellen White says that those that re- reject the new never really understood the old. Okay, Dwight. Okay. Now, Smith's continuation, a revolution exactly answering to this description did take place in France at the time indicated in the prophecy. Voltaire had sowed the seeds which bore their legitimate and baleful fruit. That godless infidel in his impious but impotent self-conceit had said, I am weary of hearing people repeat that 12 men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Associating with himself such men as Rousseau, D'Alembert, Deverit, and others, he undertook the work. They sowed to the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Their efforts accumulated in the revolution of 1793 when the Bible was discarded and the existence of the deity denied as the voice of the nation. The historian thus describes this great religious change. It was not enough, they said, for a regenerate nation to have dethroned earthly kings. Unless she stretched out the arm of defiance toward those powers, which superstition had represented as reigning over boundless space. Scott's Napoleon, Volume 1, page 172. Now, again, he says, Scott's Napoleon, the constitutional bishop of Paris was brought forward to play the principal part in the most impudent and scandalous farce ever enacted in the face of a national representation. He was brought forward in full procession to declare to the convention that the religion which he had taught so many years was, in every respect, a piece of priestcraft, which had no foundation either in history or in sacred truth. He disowned in solemn and explicit terms the existence of the deity to whom whose worship he had been consecrated and devoted himself in future to the homage of liberty, equality, virtue, and morality. He then laid on the table his Episcopal decorations and received a fraternal embrace from the president of the convention. Several apostate priests followed the example of this prelate. For the world for the first time heard an assembly of men born and educated in civilization and assuming the right to govern one of the finest of the European nations uplift their united voice to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives, and renounce unanimously the belief and worship of deity. Scott's Napoleon, Volume 1, 
page 173. Now, as we continue, the late writer in Blackwood's magazine says, France is the only nation in the world concerning which the authentic record survives that as a nation, she lifted her hand in open rebellion against the author of the universe. Plenty of blasphemers, plenty of infidels there have been and still continue to be in England, Germany, Spain, and elsewhere. But France stands apart in the world's history as the single state, which by the decree of her legislative assembly pronounced that there was no God and of which the entire population of the capital and a vast majority elsewhere, women as well as men, danced and sang with joy in accepting the announcement. Now, Smith is reaching quite a bit with this. Now, so he can continue- that- Go ahead. Uh, so at that time, France was the only atheistic, atheistic power, maybe, that had been, that he was aware of. And um, so he, he wasn't living in the time when Soviet Union came to be, so right. um, he would have to have altered that to some level if he was, you know, he didn't, he didn't seem to conceive there was going to be other powers coming in that uh, would qualify, you know, with that uh, against God. Very much yeah. agreed. Now, now we also, of course, we do have France in Bible prophecy, right? So, um, you know, it's. Revelation chapter 11. So, so we do have a history. So I, I can some ways and see, you know, he, he's going to say, well, this is France and we have it, its match in, in Revelation 11. We can see France is there, right? Now, so it's Sodom in Egypt, right? France is Sodom in Egypt. Right. So if it's Sodom in Egypt, then it's the king of the south, which is Egypt. And yet, he's going to have in Daniel 11, verse 40, he's going to have the king of the south come against this atheistic power. So it's another inconsistency, where when we understand that the king of the south is Egypt and that France is the king of the south in 1798, then it's in perfect agreement. Okay. So, so I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the characteristic that he's even describing here is is Sodom as well as Egypt, right? Regarding France, it's licentiousness and it's atheism. But but he still really hasn't established that that this power in uh, D- Daniel eleven thirty six is an atheistic power. He's he's just m- taken out of context. In verse 37, you know, he he's not going to regard any God, but just takes that out of the context of that verse. For he shall magnify himself above all. Now, we also have he's not going to regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Right. Which which we can easily apply to the papacy. How would we apply that to? To France. Well, would we agree with Smith's comment on that portion? Because Smith has, Smith says this, the word for woman and wife are in the original the same. And Bishop Newton observes that this passage would be more properly rendered the desire of wives. Which, which would of course apply it to the papacy. Right. <laughs> but the desire of women if we look at the desire of women as as this would be presented throughout the Old Testament, wouldn't this have a, a, a completely different connotation? Because here Smith is here here the Bible is saying, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. The only thing that has ever lifted itself up above heaven has been the adversary and the adversary's main tool, which has been the papacy. Yes. And 
And so this this fits more with the papacy than, I mean, I don't see in any way how you could say that this, I mean, he's going to, I guess, try to say, well, they don't care about wives, um, you know, but but that just doesn't really make any sense. That, you understand what I'm saying? That That atheistic France, there's no way that you could say that it doesn't regard the desire of women. But you can't say that about the papacy because that's basically the papal priesthood, right? Correct. So, But Smith, as he continued here, makes this comment. This would seem to indicate, it's misspelled in the original. This would seem to indicate that this government at the same time it declared that God did not exist, would trample underfoot the law which God has given to regulate the marriage institution. And we find that the historian has, unconsciously perhaps, and if so, all the more significantly, coupled together the atheism and licentiousness of this government in the same order in which they are presented in the prophecy. Right. So he's so he's going to have here Sodom and Egypt. Right. Right. But but I don't think that you can say the desire of wives the way that he tries to interpret this, that this just has to do with trampling under law that the God has given to regulate the marriage institution. That, it doesn't really make any sense. Okay. I, I don't even understand how he how he could take the desire of wives because this is about desire, but which is, is not a negative thing here, right? This just has to do with the light of, of wives. And, and, and that can't be, that's not really true of, of atheistic France. I mean, because people wanted to get married still. Okay. Now a couple of comments from the chat. Is it France? that has justifiable homicide when a husband catches his wife in the act of adultery. Something or, or, like, a wife or, or a wife or husband. Yes. Okay. Something like when the death decree comes. God's people will be declared worthy of death for refusing to worship their false god, like the reverse image. And then a following comment. The latest jubilee declared by Francis ends with the closing of St. Peter's Basilica, Holy Door, 1-6 of 26. You might want to check that. I was checking it last night, and I didn't see that it was going to 1-6 of 26, that it was ending in 25. A counter, uh, is this a counterfeit close of probation? It's supposed to celebrate reconciliation with the adversaries so we can expect an onslaught of ecumenicanism. Indulgences are supposedly granted Catholics for pilgrimages and other holy works. So now Smith continued quoting Bishop Newton, I would assume. No, he's not. He's quoting Scott's Napoleon. Yeah, Scott's Napoleon. Yeah. Interesting. Intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage, the most sacred engagement which human beings can form, and the permanence of which leads most strongly to the consolidation of society, to the state of a mere civil contract of a transitory character, which any two persons might engage in, and cast loose at pleasure when their taste is changed, or their appetite has been gratified. If fiends had set themselves to work to discover a mode of most effectual destroying whatever is venerable, graceful, or permanent in domestic life, and obtaining at the same time an assurance that the mischief which it was their object to create should be perpetrated from one generation to another, they could not have invented a more effectual plan than the degradation of marriage into a state of mere occasional cohabitation or licensed concubinage. Sophie Arnaud, an actress famous for the witty things she said, 
describes the Republican marriage as the sacrament of adultery. These anti-religious and anti-social regulations did not answer the purpose of the frantic and inconsiderate zealots by whom they had been urged forward. Scott's Napoleon, Volume 1, page 173. Nor regard any God. In addition to the testimony already presented to show the utter atheism of the nation at this time, the following fearful language of madness and presumption is to be recorded. The fear of God is so far from being the beginning of wisdom that it is the beginning of folly. Modesty is only an invention of refined voluptuousness. The Supreme King, the God of the Jews and the Christians, is but a phantom Jesus Christ is an imposter. Now, I agree with the points that's already been made. Smith could not see that there would be other nations following this with France. Yet, it's very interesting that the Jacobins of the time when France was rising up, are the communists of today. And I believe that was Marx that actually noted that. Another writer says, in August 26, 1792, an open profession of atheism was made by the National Convention, and corresponding societies and atheistical clubs were everywhere fearlessly held in the French nation. Massacres in the reign of terror became the most horrid. Smith's Key to Revelation, page 323. Yeah. So, so basically, I mean, we can agree with the atheism of France. And as Stephen pointed out, it's also going to apply to the Soviet Union. But the phrase, nor regard any God, is not an atheistic uh, phrase. Sure. It doesn't describe atheism. It, not regarding a God in the context of that verse is the fact because the papacy puts itself above all. And, and that is true of the papacy. Now it's partly true of France in some ways, but France doesn't put itself in the place of God. Right now, you know, so part of, part of the thing here uh, to, so magnifying himself, we know that this is making himself great. That's Gadol, Right. He shall magnify himself. So this this phrase occurs many times in Daniel, or that word, magnifying himself. So um, we have it in 825. And through his policy also he shall cause to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. So we have it translated as magnify. And, and that's going to refer at that time to, to pagan Rome. Uh, we have it in, uh, uh, you know, the, each of these powers, the goat wax is very great, right? So, so this is this constant, uh, magnification, right? So it's just translated as magnified, but it, it's, it's the same word as, um, he waxed exceeding great, right? We got that uh, Gadol. Again and again, we have this uh, this word, 1431. Um, and then uh, there's another trend word. Oh, yeah. He became, just trying to see. There's another verse. Anyway, there's there's lots of verses where we can apply this to the papacy. Can we say that of France? I don't think we can. I don't see that France fulfills every detail of the prophecy. Well, I don't think it fulfills, of those three things that he listed, it doesn't fulfill any of them. You know, well, in the sense that, I mean, it does fulfill atheism, but his verse saying that it's atheism doesn't, isn't regarding atheism. It's actually something that would be better fulfilled by the papacy not regarding any other God, because he magnifies himself above all of them. And we, and we don't see that. We don't see it grow into a world kingdom, right? No. Which, which is what it has to do in order to become great. 
because this is this progression of these world kingdoms. France never attains to that status, especially atheistic France. Okay, comment from the chat. When France placed a harlot on the throne, it was like what the world will do when the when the woman dressed in purple and scarlet. It's possible. Anyway, the point is here in these verses, from all that that all that he has said about France is true, but it doesn't apply to these verses. Right. You know, and 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 we go on, you know, because he's going to honor the God God of forces, right? He's going to uh, do all these things in, with a strange God, whom his whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. Um, you know, we we apply all these things to the papacy. This fits perfectly well with the papacy. Well, and and it doesn't apply to France. Another observation from the chat is which three tribes or nations did France brutally subdue or did they subdue at all? Well, none, right? So, but yeah, but that's not even really the point here. It, it, you know, he's going to have this change all of a sudden in verse 36, right? He's going to say, you know, we have the papacy up to verse 35 and now all of a sudden a new power is introduced, France. And, and the whole purposes of this is that when he gets to verse 40, is that he's going to have Egypt come against France and he's going to have Turkey come against France. So he wants Egypt still to be the king of the south, even though France is Sodom and Egypt. Right? Right. So, but he's not taking that into account because uh, he, he believes without any real support that uh, that you're still going to maintain the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south in Daniel 11, verse 40, which we shouldn't by that point because we're not dealing with Greece anymore, right? Greece has passed. Rome has risen. Rome has taken the place of the king of the north. That's very, very clear. And then the papacy assumes, you know, the trappings of the Roman Empire, right? Paganism, but it clothes it with Christian garb. So it becomes the king of the north. So, yeah, it just, it, to me, it's amazing that people still hold to Smith's view. Like that Adventist can read what Smith has written here and say, yeah, this makes sense. Well, but I've seen people do it. They just ignore everything, like everything, pretty much. Um, you know, they're going to ignore Sodom and Egypt, uh, all of these other other things regarding France that we're going to apply in Revelation chapter 11. So yeah. if you believe Revelation chapter 11 is France, then you believe that it's Sodom and Egypt. And if it's Egypt, it's not going to come against itself. I mean, I, I just keep saying it over and over again. But it's just, like, not sensible. But that's what Smith has done. So, and, and I understand why, right? He's trying to preserve something. But what he was preserving was Alexander Keith, who wasn't an Adventist. And just because Josiah Litch repeated these ideas doesn't mean they were correct because they don't agree with Miller, as, as we noted. Miller doesn't interpret this as France. Now, Miller's going to have difficulty interpreting, and, and we can understand why the Millerites are having difficulty interpreting Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, because it's, it's something out of the scope of what they could see. They're not going to see 1989. Right? They're not going to see the Russian Revolution. They're not going to see where all this is going to lead. So, so it's understandable. So Smith is trying to preserve this. And, and if we deal with this idea of new light and old light, we can see that 
that there are certain things that the pioneers did not have as an established truth. They, they don't really have an established understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. We can agree with that, right? Yes. It, was, it wasn't part of their message. You know, we have, um, we have some comments about it um, by Miller, but no real direction of interpretation of what it exactly means. And then we have Josiah Lich's um, repeating of Alexander Keith's ideas, mixed a little bit with some of, of his own. But basically, when we looked at it, it was just Alexander Keith. That's all Josiah Lich was presenting. Uriah Smith, he's just repeating that. But he should have been able to have further light, maybe not like what we can see, but he should have been able to see what at least James White saw. Okay. Well, go on, Dwight. Okay. We're talking about some other site or something in your chat. Right. I What I had done was, when I was doing a search on this last night. On it, that Jubilee thing? Yes. On that yeah. Jubilee thing. Okay. It was, it was interesting because they're, they're stating, using Google, that this Jubilee, this holy year that Catholics are going to have that the Pope is declaring will run from Tuesday, December 24th of 2024 through Sunday, December 14th of 2025. Mm -hmm. And so I was just, I was responding to part of a comment that had been made that this was going to be until uh, January 6th of 26. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure really how significant it is. I mean, the Pope's always doing all kinds of stuff, but yeah, and I guess people are having a hard time viewing the page. But anyway, let's go back to to what Uriah Smith is saying here. Okay. Now, Herbe or Herbert, however you want to pronounce that in French. Comé. Okay. Comé. And their associates appeared at the bar and declared that God did not exist. Allison, Volume 1, page 150. At this juncture, all religious worship was prohibited except that of liberty and the country. The gold and the silver plate of the churches was seized upon and desecrated. The churches were closed, the bells were broken and cast into cannon. The Bible was publicly burned. The sacramental vessels were paraded through the streets on an ass in token of contempt. The Sabbath was abolished and death was declared in conspicuous letters posted over their burial places to be an eternal sleep. But the crowning blasphemy, blasphemy, if these orgies of hell admit of degrees, remained to be performed by the comedian Monvey who is a priest of Illuminism, said, God, if you exist, avenge your injured name. I bid you defiance. You remain silent. You dare not launch your thunders. Who, after all this, will believe in your existence? The whole ecclesiastical establishment was destroyed. Scott's Napoleon, Volume 1, page 173. Behold what man is left. Oh, excuse me. Behold what man is when left to himself. And what infidelity is when the restraints of law are thrown off, and it has the power in its own hands. Can it be doubted that these scenes are what the omnificent eye foresaw and noted on the sacred page when it is pointed out a kingdom to arise which should exalt itself above every god and disregard them all? Now, that's Smith's comment. And now we come to verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and with pleasant things. So Smith's comment. We see a seeming contradiction in this verse. Now, I would, I would still tend to go back. Looking at this from some of what we we dealt with before, because Daniel eleven thirty eight 
has multiple alternative readings. So, but in his estate, can say, but in his stead. But here again, you would have a better clue on this as to what the Hebrew reads. I'm just going from the 1769 Bible. Yeah, just place, in his place. Okay. So the, the other of the Hebrew, according to the 1769 Bible, would be, as for the Almighty God, in his seat he shall honor, yea, he shall honor a God whom such, you know, as we're going through this. But they give a, a cross-reference here to Isaiah 44, 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit, and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know, and they may be ashamed. Yeah, it now, definitely applies much more to um, to the papacy. Okay. Right? Because because what they're going to have is we we have their fathers being paganism, right? Right. So paganism, they worship, you know, the Greek and Roman gods and all these types of different things. There's all different types of paganism. If this is going to be a god that paganism did not know. Right. That is Christ. Right. So we have all of these images and idols, these Christian uh, statues that would not be recognized by paganism. Right. I mean, they're, they're taken from paganism in a sense, the idolatry of the Catholic Church. But it's, it's now dressed up in a way that it's not a God that their fathers would have known. I mean, it, it doesn't apply to France. Right. It's reaching, it's reaching in a very large manner. So, so when we looked at this, we, um, uh, you know, was just trying to understand uh, the way to translate this. Um, but it is in his, that it is Christ's estate. In Christ's place, shall he, the papacy, honor in the place of God, in, in the place of the God of strength. So that is uh, the way that we, we interpreted or translated this. That is, but in his, that is in Christ's estate, shall he, that is the papacy, honor in the place of the God of strength, a God whom his fathers knew not. And his fathers, of course, is reference to uh, uh, paganism, right? Right. So this is this counterfeit Christ, shall he honor with gold and silver, with precious stones. I just don't see how this could apply to France, but it, it really does apply to uh, the papacy and because he puts himself in the place of Christ, the papacy does, and then honors this, this new God, this, these idols, this counterfeit Christ with gold, silver, precious stones, pleasant things. So it's the idolatrous worship of the papacy. And I don't see how you could you could say that that's France, but but he sees this. Well, there is a contradiction in the verse. I wouldn't say it's a seeming contradiction. It is a contradiction that that he has set up by saying it's an atheistic power. Now, the way that I, I, I translated this, I, I, I guess I gave a paraphrase. But as to the Almighty God, shall he honor in his place the human heart? Yea, shall he honor a God, a counterfeit Christ, whom his fathers knew not? with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. So that's how we finally came up to that interpretation of that verse or the translation of that verse. Okay. Because we decided that that God, but in his, his, his state shall he honor the God. So, so this is going to be, but as to the almighty God. So we, we took this, this sentence quite differently. So where it says about, the God of, in his estate, he shall honor the God of for forces. We didn't interpret that verse that way at all. We were saying that, but as to the almighty God, so that God there is the almighty God. 
shall he honor in his place. So it's it it actually kind of takes the sentence quite syntactically different. Um, does that make sense to people? What 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 we had done before? People remember why we did that. Part of why we're going through this is that, and I'll speak for myself. I don't remember all of why we did that. Okay. So when we looked at the Hebrew, right? So it's actually going to start with the word, the, the sentence starts with the word God. And it, and it says, va, the vav, right? So that just means and or but. And then it has a lamed, which means, uh, which is why we translated that, but in, um, what was the word we used? But as to, right? So that word lamed means to. So when you go va lamed, that L sound, la, um, and then they have the word God, right? So that's how the verse begins. It doesn't say, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. It says, but as to God, vavla eloa. Um, and then the next word is 4581 maaz, that it is strength. So, but as to the God of strength, that's what it says literally in the Hebrew. And then it has uh, a preposition following that above. He shall place um, kabod, right? So uh, honor, right? Like ikabod, right? Right. Kabod. It's actually ikabod in the Hebrew. Ikabod, right? So the the root is kabod, but here in in the Hebrew itself, in the verse, it says ikabod. Um. So that's uh, we we think of that ikabod as as the glory has departed, right? Um, right? And then, um, and then he's a God whom his fathers did not honor, shall he honor. So it, it's pretty clear in the Hebrew, actually, that, that this King James verse doesn't actually make sense. It's not what it says in Hebrew at all. So they, 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 they're, they're mixing up the grammar because it is pretty clear that it, but as to the God, of strength that is God Almighty, right? He shall honor in his place a God whom his fathers knew not. Okay. Hmm. That's kind of weird why they translated it this way. It's a very different situation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the translators give you know um, you know forces or munitions or so forth. Uh, from Maz, Mauzin, but it's actually Maaus, Mauzin, so that is, uh, that's just the dual plural, so that would refer to God. So it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of weird why they translated it the way they did, why they didn't just translate it directly. Huh. So Smith continues. Mm-hmm. How can a nation disregard every god, yet honor the god of forces? It could not at one and the same time hold both these positions. But it might for a time disregard all gods, and then subsequently introduce another worship and regard the god of forces. It's, yeah, and of course it doesn't say this here in Hebrew at all. Exactly. Right. So, Did such a change occur in France at the this time it did the attempt to make france a godless nation produced such anarchy that the rulers feared the power would pass entirely out of their hands and therefore perceived that as a political necessity some kind of worship must be introduced and they did not intend to introduce any movement which would increase devotion or develop any true spiritual character among the people but only such as would keep themselves in power and give them control of the national fortunes. A few extracts from history will show this. Liberty and country were at first the objects of adoration. 
liberty, equality, virtue, and morality, the very opposite of anything they possessed in fact or exhibited in practice, were the words which they set forth as describing the deity of the nation. In 1794, the worship of the goddess of reason was introduced and is thus described by the historian. One of the ceremonies of this insane time stands unrivaled for the absurdity combined with impiety. The doors of the convention were thrown open to a band of musicians, preceded by whom the members of the municipal body entered in solemn procession, singing a hymn in praise of liberty and escorting as the object of their future worship a veiled female whom they termed the goddess of reason. Being brought within the bar, she was unveiled with great form and placed on the right hand of the president, where she was generally recognized as a dancing girl of the opera, with whose charms most of the persons present were acquainted from her appearance on the stage while the experience of individuals was further extended. To this person, as the fittest representative of that reason whom they had worshipped, the National Convention of France rendered public homage. This impious and ridiculous mummery had a certain fashion, and the installation of the goddess of reason was renewed and imitated throughout the nation in such places where the inhabitants desired to show themselves equal to all the heights of the revolution. Scott's Life of Napoleon. Now, we are close to our time for today. We need to consider this portion. We need to think about what we have covered today, how so much of this has been twisted to fit a narrative, yet that twisting has little to do with what scripture really says well and, and we know that he's correct here about france but it just doesn't apply here right and it doesn't it doesn't fit these verses it does fit with revelation chapter 11 so i guess he's got the wrong book he, he, he should be doing revelation 11 instead of daniel 11 okay yeah so we'll we'll come back to this i guess we'll finish off this one tomorrow Okay. Now, a comment from the chat was giving the dis the definition of mummery. It's a noun, an entertainment or frolic in masks, a farcical entertainment in which masks person play antic tricks. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So they practiced mummery so that they would dance around with a mask rather than dancing around in their own face or in their own name. That's interesting. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we would withdraw in horror from the thought of those that would seek to lift themselves up above you. We ask, Father, for your guidance through this day. Help us now and direct us so that that which we do may honor you, may glorify you, and may lift you up. Help us to this end. Direct us now, we ask. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.